Yeah, welcome to our next talk. Social cooling. You know, people say, I have no problem with surveillance, I have nothing to hide. But then, you know, maybe the neighbors, and maybe this, and maybe that. So, tonight, we're going to hear Timon Schep, Fuß von Holland. He's a privacy designer and a freelance. Um, security researcher, and he's going to hold a talk about how digital surveillance changes our social way of interacting. So please let's have a hand for Taiman Schip. Hi everyone, it's really cool that you're all here and really happy to talk here, it's a, really an honor. My name is, my name is Thijmen Schep and I am a technology critic and that means that um, it's my job to not believe what he tells us um, and that's really a lot of fun. Um, the is how do I get a wider audience involved in understanding technology and the issues that are arising from technology? Um, because I believe that change comes when the public demands it. I think that's really one of the important things uh, when change happens. And for me, as a, as a technology critic, for me, words are very much how I hack the system, how I try to hack this, this world. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about one of these words that I think could help us. Because um, framing the issue is half the battle. If we can frame the problem, if we can explain what the problem is um, in a certain frame that, that you know, makes certain position already v visible, that's really uh, half the battle won. So that frame is social cooling. Um, but before I go into that, I want to ask a question. Who here recognizes this? You're on Facebook or some other uh, social site. And, um, to click on the link because you think, oh, I could, it's a, could click on this, but it might look bad. I, it might be remembered by someone, some agency might remember it, and I could click on it, but I'm hesitant to click. What? Is that better? Can everyone hear me now? No? Okay, is that the, yeah. Should I start again? Okay. So you're on Facebook, and you're thinking, "Ooh, that's an interesting link. I could click on that," but you're hesitating because maybe someone's going to remember that, and that might come back to me later. And and who here recognizes that feeling? So pretty much almost everybody. And that's increasingly what I find when I when I talk about this issue that people really start to recognize this. Um. And I think a word we could use to describe that is click fear. Like this, this, this hesitation, this could be click fear. And you're not alone. Increasingly, we find that research points that this is a wide problem, that people are hesitating to click on a lot of links. For example, after the Snowden revelations, people were less likely to research uh, issues about terrorism and other things on Wikipedia because they thought, well, maybe the NSA won't like it if I search that. Okay, I'm not going to move. Um, and we see it in Google as well. So this is a, yeah, a, a pattern that, that research are pointing to. And it's not very strange, of course. I mean, we all understand that if you feel you're being watched, you change your behavior. That's a very logical yeah, thing that we all understand. And I believe that technology is really amplifying this effect. I think that's something that we really have to come to grips with. Um, and that's why I think social cooling could be a useful word that. Social cooling describes, in a way, how in an increasingly uh, digital world, where our digital li lives are increasingly, increasingly digitized, um, it becomes easier uh, to feel this pressure, to feel these normative effects of these systems. Um, and very much you see that because increasingly your data is being turned into thousands of scores by data brokers and other companies. And those scores are increasingly influences your, influencing your chances in life. And this is creating an engine of, 
of oppression, an engine of um, change that we have to understand. And the fun thing is that, in a way, this, is, this, this idea is already really being helped by Silicon Valley, who for a long time have said data is a new gold, but they've recently, in the last five years, changed that narrative. Now they're saying data is the new oil. And that's really funny, because if data is a new oil, then immediately you get the question, wait, oil gave us global warming, so then what does data give us? Right, so, and I believe that, that oil, if oil leads to global warming, then data could lead to social cooling. That could be the word that we use for these negative effects of big data. In order to really understand this and go into it, we have to look at three things. First, we're going to talk about the reputation economy, how that system works. Second chapter, we're going to look at behavior change, how this is influencing us and changing our behavior. And finally, to not let you all go home depressed, I'm going to talk about how can we deal with this. So first, the reputation economy. Already we've seen uh, today that China is building this new system, the social credit system. It's a system that will give every citizen in China a score that basically represents how well behaved they are. And it will influence your ability to get a job, a loan, a visa, and even a date. Uh, for example, the current version of the system, Sesame Credit, one of the early prototypes, uh, already gives everybody uh, that wants to a score, but it also is connected to the largest dating website in China. So um, you can kind of find out, like, is this person that I'm dating? What kind of person is this? Is this someone who's, you know, well viewed by Chinese uh, society? This is where it gets really heinous for me, because until now you could say, well, these reputation systems, they're, they're fair. If you're a good person, you get a higher score. If you're a bad person, you get a lower score. But it's not that simple. I mean, your friend's score influences your score, and your score influences your friend's score. And that's where you really start to see how you know, complex uh, social pressures arrive, and where we can see the effects maybe of, of data stratification, where people start to think, hey, who are my friends, and who should I be friends with? OK, now you could think, that only happens in China. Those Chinese people are, you know, different. But the exact same thing is happening here in the West, except we're letting the market build it. I'll give you an example. This is a company called Deemly, a Danish company, and this is their video for their service. Nope. Renting apartments from others, and she loves to swap trendy clothes and dresses. She's looking to catch her first lift from a rideshare app, but has no previous reviews to help support her. Aww. Luckily, she's just joined Deemly, where her positive feedback from the other sites appears as a Deem score, helping her to win a rideshare in no time. Deemly is free to join and support users across many platforms, helping you to share and benefit from the great reputation you've earned. Imagine the power of using your Deem score alongside your CV for a job application. Like in China. Perhaps to help get a bank loan. Like it. Or even to link to from your dating profile. Like in China. Sign up now at Deemly.co. Deemly. Better your sharing. Thanks. <laughs> there is a change. There is a difference, though. Um, the th fun thing about here is that it's highly invisible to us. Like the Chinese government is very open about what they're building, but here we are very blind to what's going on. So mostly when we talk about these things, then we're talking about these systems that give us a very clear rating, like Airbnb, uh, Uber, and of course the Chinese system. But the thing is, most of these systems are invisible to us. There's a huge market of data brokers who are, you know, not visible to you because you are not the customer. You are the product. And these data brokers, um, well, what they do is they, they gather as much data as possible about you, and that's not all. Um, they then create up to 8,000 scores about you. In the United States, these companies have up to 8,000 scores, and in, in Europe, it's a little less of around 600. These are scores about things like your IQ, your psychological profile, your gullibility, your religion, your estimated lifespan, 8,000 of these different things about you. Um, and how does that work? Well, it works by machine learning. So machine learning algorithms can find patterns in society that we can really not anticipate. For example, let's say you're a diabetic. And, well, let's say your data broker company has uh, a mailing list or has an app that diabetic patients use. And they also have the data of these diabetic patients, what they do on Facebook. Well, then you can start to see correlations. So if diabetic patients more often like gangster rap and pottery, on Facebook, well, then you could deduce from that that if you also like gangster rap and pottery on Facebook, 
that perhaps you also are more likely to have or get diabetes. This is highly unscientific, but this is how this system works. Um, and this is an example of, of how that works with just your Facebook scores. HC was lowest, about 60% when it came to predicting whether a user's parents were still together when they were 21. People whose parents divorced before they were 21 tended to like statements about relationships. Drug users were ID'd with about 65% accuracy, smokers with 73%, and drinkers with 70%. Sexual orientation was also easier to distinguish among men, 88% right there. For women, it was about 75%. Gender, by the way, race religion and political views were predicted with high accuracy as well. For instance, white versus black, 95%. So an important thing to understand here is that this isn't really about your data anymore. Like oftentimes when we talk about data protection, we talk about, oh, I want to keep control of my data. But this is their data. This is data that they deduce, that they derive from your data. These are opinions about you. And these things are what you know, make it so that even though you never filled in a, a psychological test, they have one. A great example of that and how that's used is a company called Cambridge Analytica. This company um, has created detailed profiles about us through something, um, through what they call psychographics, and I'll let them explain it themselves. By having hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans undertake this survey, we were able to form a model to predict the personality of every single adult in the United States of America. If you know the, the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate more effectively with those key audience groups. So, for a highly neurotic and conscientious audience, you're gonna need a message that is rational, and fear-based or emotionally based. In this case, uh, the threat of a burglary and the insurance policy of a gun is very persuasive. And we can see where these people are on the map. If we wanted to drill down further, we could resolve the data to an individual level, where we have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every adult in the United States. So yeah. This is the company that worked with both the, for the Brexit campaign and with the Trump campaign. Of course, a little after the Trump campaign, all the data was leaked. So data on 200 uh, million Americans was leaked. And including, you, again, you see this data described as modeled voter ethnicities and religions. So this is this derived data. So you might think that when you go online and use Facebook and use all these services, that advertisers are paying for you. That's a common misperception. That's not really the case. What's really going on is that According to FC research, the majority of the money made in this data broker market is made from risk management. Right? So, in a way, you could say that it's not, not, really insur of, um, not really marketers that are paying for you, it's your bank, it's insurers, it's your employer, it's governments. These kind of organizations are the ones who buy these profiles, the most, more than, uh, than the other ones. Of course, the promise of big data is that you can then manage risk. Big data is the idea that with data you can understand things and then manage them. So what really is innovation in this big data world, in this data economy, is the democratization of the background check. That's really the core of this, this market, that now you can find out everything about everyone. So yeah, now you're, uh, in the past only perhaps your bank could know your credit score, but now your greengrocer knows your psychological profile. Right? That's a new level of, of yeah, what's going on here. It's not only it's not market not only invisible, but it's also huge. According to the same research by the FCC, this market was already worth 150 billion dollars in 2015. So it's invisible, it's huge, and hardly anyone knows about it. But that's probably going to change. And that brings us to the second part: behavior change. We already see this first part of this: how, be how behavioral change is happening through these systems, and that's through outside influence, and we've. We've talked a lot about this uh, at this conference. For example, we see how Facebook and advertisers try to do that. We've also seen how China is doing that, trying to influence you. Russia has recently tried to use Facebook to influence the elections. And of course, companies like, like Cambridge Analytica try to do the same thing. And here you can have a debate on, you know, to what extent are they really influencing us? But I think that's not actually the really the most interesting question. What interests me most of all is how we are doing it ourselves, how we are creating new forms of self-censorship and, and um, are proactively anticipating these systems. 
Because once you realize that this is really about risk management, you start to and this is about banks and employers trying to understand you, when people start to understand that, you know, this will go beyond click fear, you might remember. This is, will go beyond, this will become, you know, when people find out, this will be, you know, not getting a job, for example. This will be about getting really expensive insurance. This will be about all these kinds of, of problems, and people are increasingly finding this out. So, for example, in the United States, if you... Uh, the IRS might now use data profiles, are now using data profiles to find out who they should audit. So I was talking recently to a girl and, and she said, oh, I recently tweeted about a negative tweet about the IRS and she immediately grabbed her phone to delete it when she realized that, you know, this could now be used against her in a way. And that's the problem. Of course, we see all kinds of other crazy examples that the, big, the audience, the, the, major, the wider public is picking up on, like, Ooh, so we now have algorithms that can find out if you're gay or not. Um, these things scare people, and these things are, are yeah, something you have to understand. So chilling effects, this is what this boils down to. For me, more importantly than um, these influences of these big uh, companies and nation states is how people themselves are experiencing these chilling effects like you yourself have as well. That brings us back to social cooling. For me, social cooling is about these two things combined. At one hand, this incre increasing ability of agents and, and, and groups to influence you. On the other hand, the increasing uh, willingness of people themselves to change their own behavior, to proactively engage with this uh, issue. There are three long-term consequences that I want to dive into. The first is how this affects the individual. The second is how it affects society. And the third is how it affects the market. So let's look at the individual. Here, we've already seen there's a rising culture of self-censorship. Um, it started for me with an article that I read in the New York Times, where a student was saying, well, we're very, very reserved. She was going to things like spring break, and said, well, you, you don't want to have to defend yourself later, so you don't do it. And what she's talking about, she's talking about doing crazy things, you know, letting go, uh, having fun. And she's worried that the next day it'll be on Facebook. So what's happening here is that you do have all kinds of freedoms. You have the freedom to look up things, you have the freedom to, to say things but you're hesitating to use it. And that's really insidious. That has an effect on a wider society. And here we really see the societal value of privacy. Because in society, often minority values later become majority values. An example is, is weed. Uh, I'm, from, I'm from the Netherlands. And there you see, um, you know, at first it's something that you just don't do, and it's you know, a bit of a ooh. But then, oh, maybe, yeah, Jan, you should, you should try it as well, and then people try it, and slowly, under the surface of the society, people change their minds about these things. And then after a while, it's like, you know, what are we still worried about? Oh, this same pattern happens, of course, with way bigger things like this. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. This is the same pattern that's happening for all kinds of things that, that change in society. And that's what privacy is so important for. And that's why it's so important that people have the ability to look things up and to change their minds and to talk about each other without feeling so watched all the time. The third thing is how this impacts the market. And here we see very much the rise of a culture of, of risk avoidance. Um, an example here is that in 1995, already doctors in New York were given scores. Um, and what happened was that the doctors who... Um, try to help advanced stage cancer patients, complex patients who try to do the operation, difficult operations, got a low score because these people more often died. Well, the doctors that didn't lift a finger, didn't try to help, got a high score because, well, people didn't die. So you see here that these systems, that they bring all kinds of perverse incentives. They, you know, they, they lower the, the willingness of everybody to take risks. And in some areas of society, we really like people to take risks. They're you know, like uh, entrepreneurs, doctors. So, in the whole part, you could say that this, what we're seeing here is some kind of trickle-down risk aversion, where the, willing, the, the, the way that companies and, and governments want to manage risk, that's trickling down to us. And we, are, we, of course, want them to like us, want to have a job, we want to have insurance, and then we increasingly start to think, oh, maybe I should not do this. It's a subtle effect. So, how do we deal with this? Well, together, I think this is a really big problem. I think this is such a big problem that, that it can't be managed by just some, some hackers or nerds building something or by politicians making a law. This is a really uh, society-wide problem. So I want to talk about all these groups that, that, that should get into this. The public, politicians, business, and us, finally. 
So the public. I think we have to talk about and maybe extend the metaphor of the cloud and say we have to learn to see the stars behind the cloud. Right? That's one way that we could, that's a narrative we could use. I really like to use humor to explain this to a wider audience. So for example, um, uh, last year I was part of an exhibit, helped develop an exhibit about uh, dubious devices. And one of the devices there was called Taste Your Status, which was a coffee machine that gives you coffee based on your area code. So if you live in a good area code, you get nice coffee. <laughs> you live in a bad area code, you get bad coffee. <laughs> I won't go into it, but um, these have, like, oftentimes you can use humor to explain things to a wider audience. I really like that, that approach. We've got a long way to go, though. I mean, if we look at the long, you know, how long it took for us to understand global warming to really you know, come to a stage where most people understand what it is and care about it and accept Donald Trump. Um, well, with data, we really got a long way to go. We're really at the beginning of understanding this issue like this. OK, so the second group that has to really wake up is, is politicians. And they have to understand that this is really about the balance of power. This is really about power. And if you'll permit me, I'll go into the big picture a little bit as a a media theorist. So this is called Gilles Deleuze. He's a French philosopher um, and he explained in his work something that I find really useful. He said you have two systems of control in society and the one is the institutional one and it's the one that we all know. You know the, 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 the judicial system so you're free uh, to do what you want but then you cross a line, you cross a law, then the police get you, you go in front of a judge, you go to prison. This is a system we all understand. But he says there's another system, which is the social system. This is a, the social pressure system. And this for a long time wasn't really designed, but now increasingly we are able to do that. So this is a system where you perform suboptimal behavior, and then that gets measured and judged, and then you get subtly nudged in the right direction. Now there's some very important differences between these two systems. The institutional system you know, has this idea that you're a free citizen that makes up your own mind. And you know, well, the social system is like, that's working all the time. Constantly, it doesn't matter if you're guilty or innocent, it's always trying to push you. The old system, the, the, the institutional system, is very much about punishment. So if you break the rules, you get punishment. But people sometimes don't really care about punishment. Sometimes it's cool to get punishment. But the social system uses something way more powerful, which is the fear of exclusion. We are social animals and we really care to belong to a group. The other difference is that, it is very important, uh, the institutional system is accountable, you know, democratically to us. Well, the social system at the moment is really, really invisible. Like these algorithms, how they work, where the data is going, it's very hard to understand. Of course, it's exactly what China loves so much about it, right? There's no, you can stand in front of a tank, but you can't really stand, stand in front of the cloud. So yeah, that's, that's great. It also helps me to understand when people say I have nothing to hide. I really understand that because when people say I have nothing to hide, what they're saying is I have nothing to hide from the old system, from the classic system, from the institutional system. They're saying, I want to help the police. I trust our government. I trust our institutions. And that's actually really a positive thing to say. The thing is, they don't really see the other part of the system, how increasingly there are parts that are not uh, you know, controlled, they're not democratically checked, and that's really a problem. So the third thing that I think we have to wake up is, is business. Business has to see that this is not so much a, a problem, perhaps, but that it could be an opportunity. I think I'm still looking for the metaphor here, but. Perhaps if we, you know, again, com compare this issue to global warming, we could say that we need something like ecological food for data. And, but I don't know what that's going to look like or how we're going to explain that. Maybe we have to talk about fast food versus uh, fast data versus ecological data. But we need a metaphor here. Of course, laws are also really helpful. Um, so we might get things like this. Uh, and... <laughs> I'm actually working on this, it's funny. Um, or if things go really out of hand, we might get here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so luckily we see that in Europe, the, the, the politicians are awake and are really trying to push this market. I think that's really great. So I think in the future we'll get to a moment where people say, well, I prefer European smart products, for example. I think that's a good thing. I think this is really positive. Finally, I want to get to all of us, what each of us can do. I think here again there's a parallel to global warming where at its core it's not so much about the new technology and all the issues, it's about a new mindset, a new way of looking at the world. Um, and I here think we have to stop saying that we have nothing to hide, for example. If I've learned anything in the past years on standing and researching privacy and this, this big data market is privacy is the right to be imperfect. 
Right? Increasingly, there's pressure to be the perfect citizen, to be the perfect consumer. And privacy is a way of getting out of that. So this is how I would reframe privacy. It's not just being about which bits and bytes go where, but it's about you know, a human right to be imperfect. Because, of course, we are human. We are all imperfect. And sometimes when I talk at technology conference, people say, well, privacy was just a phase. You know, it's like ebb and flood, and, and we got it, and it's going to go away again. I'm like, that's crazy. You, know, you don't say women's rights are just a phase. We had it for a while, and it's going to go again. Right? And, of course, Edward Snowden explains it way better. He says, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. What an eloquent system admin. So I think what we have to, to strive for here is that we develop a more nuanced understanding of all these issues. Um, I think we have to go away from this idea that data, more data is better. Data is automatically progress. No, it's not. Data is a trade-off. For example, for the individual, more data might mean less psychological security. Right? Less willingness to share, less willing to, to try things. For uh, a country, it might mean less autonomy for citizens. And citizens need their own autonomy. They need to know what's going on. They need to be able to vote in their own autonomous way and decide what's, what they want. In business, you could say more data might lead to less creativity, right? less willingness to share new ideas, to come up with new ideas. Um, so that's, again, a, a, an issue there. So in conclusion... Social cooling is a way of understanding these issues, or a way of framing these issues that I think could be useful for us, that could help us understand and engage with these issues. And yes, social cooling is an alarm. It's alarmist. It is, I'm trying to say, this is the problem and we have to deal with this. But it's also really about hope. Right? I trust not so much in technology, I trust in us, in people, that we can fix this once we understand the issue. In the same way that when we understood the problem with global warming, we started to deal with it. We're doing, it's, gonna, it's slow progress, we're doing that and we can do the same thing with data it'll take a while but we'll get there and finally this is about starting to understand the difference between shallow optimism and, and deep optimism right oftentimes the technology sector is about ah oh, cool new technology and we're going to fix this by creating an app and for me that's you know oh, we have to be optimistic but that's very shallow optimism the TEDx make optimism like true optimism recognizes that each technology comes with a downside and we have to recognize that that's it's that, that's not a problem to, uh, to point out these problems. That's a good thing. It, once you understand the problems, you can deal with them and you know, come up with better solutions. If we don't change in this mindset, then we might create a world where we're all more well-behaved, but perhaps also a little bit less human. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, we still have five more minutes. We'll take some questions if you like. First microphone number two. Um, hello. Uh, thanks. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I have a question that I hope will work. It's a bit complicated. There's a project. Uh, called Indy by a foundation called the Sovereign Foundation. Uh, do you know about it? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, very great, perfect. So to, just to quickly explain, these people want to create uh, an identity layer that will be self-sovereign, which means people can reveal what they want about themselves only when they want, but is one unique identity on the entire internet. So that can potentially be very liberating because you control all your identity and in individual data. Um, but at the same time, it could be used to enable something like the personal scores we were sharing earlier on. So that made me think about that, and I wondered if you had an opinion on this. Yes, well, um, the first thing I think about is that, as I try to explain, um, you see a lot of initiatives that try to be about, oh, you have to control your own data. But that's really missing the point that it's no longer really about your data, it's about this derived data. And of course, it can help to, to manage what you share, you know, then they can't derive anything from it. But too little I see that awareness. Second of all, this is very much, for me, um, an example of what nerds and technologies are really good at. It's like, oh, we've got a social problem, let's create a technology app and then we'll fix it. Well, what I'm trying to explain is that this is such a big problem that we cannot fix this with just one group alone. Not the politicians, not the designers, not the nerds. This is something that we have to really get together, you know, grab, fix together because this is such a fundamental issue, right? The idea that risk is a problem, that we want to manage risk is such, so deeply ingrained in people. You know, such a base in fear, 
it's fundamental and it's, it's everywhere. So it's not enough for one group to try to fix that. It's, it's something that we have to come to grip with together. Thanks a lot. Okay, there is a um, signal. Angel has a question from the internet, I think. Yes, uh, Barking Sheep is asking, do you think there's a relationship between self-censorship and echo chambers in the sense that people become afraid to challenge their own belief and thus isolate themselves in groups with the same ideology? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really big answer to that one. Um, I was actually, uh, I was emailing Vince Cerf and miraculously he, he responded and he said what you really have to look for is this uh, not just the reputation economy but also the attention economy and how they're linked. So for a while I've been looking for that, that link um, and there's a lot to say there and there definitely is a link. Um, I think important to understand or what I can nuance here is that I'm not saying that everybody will become really well behaved and, and grey bookworm people. The thing is that it, what this situation is creating is that we're all becoming theater players. We're all playing in identity more and more because we're watched more of the time. And for some people that might mean that they're, you know, I think most people will be more you know, conservative and more careful. Some people will go really all out and, and they, oh, enjoy the stage. You know, we have those people as well. Um, and I think those people could really benefit and that the attention economy could really, you know, um, give them uh, a lot of attention through that. So I think there's a, there's a link there, but I could go on more, but I think it's for now where I'm going. Okay, we're short on time. We'll take, I'm sorry, one more question, number one. So the, I think the audience you're talking Louder, to here, please. The, the audience you're talking to here um, is already very aware, but I'm asking for like tactics or your tips to spread your message and to talk to people that are in this phase saying, ah, I don't care, they can surveil me. Like, what's, what's your approach, like, um, in a practical way, how do you actually do this? Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad to be here because I am, I, yes, I am a nerd, but I'm also a philosopher or a thinker, you know, and, and uh, that means that for me, what I work with is not just Arduinos, but words and ideas. I think those I've been trying to show can be really powerful, like a word can be a really powerful way to frame a debate or, or engage people. So um, I haven't found yet a way to, to push all this talk. Like, I was making a joke that I can tell you in one sentence what privacy is and why it matters, but I have to give a whole talk before that. Right? Privacy is the right to be imperfect, but in order to understand that, you have to understand the rise of the reputation economy and how that affects your chances in life. The, the fun thing is that, that that will happen by itself, that people will become more aware of that. They will run into these problems. They will not get a job or they might get other issues. And then they will start to see the problem. And so my quest is not so much to help people understand it, but to help them understand it before they run into the wall. Right? That's how usually society at the moment deals with technology problems. It's like, oh, but we'll, well, oh, we, oh, it's a problem. Oh, well, now we'll try to fix it. Well, I believe you can really uh, see these problems come way earlier. And I think the humanities, where I'm from, is really helpful in that, in trying to, you know, like Deleuze really, really clearly explaining what the problem is in 1995. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think that, um, uh, I don't have a short way of explaining, you know, uh, why privacy matters. But I think it'll become easier over time as people start to really feel these pressures. Um, sorry, thank you very much for the question. I think we all should go out and spread the message. This yeah. talk is over, I'm awfully sorry. Um, when you people leave, please take your bottles and your cups and all your junk. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Damon Schrepp. <laughs>